Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm Steve Lance. Here's a look at some of the stories we've been covering for you today. Today marks the first year of President Biden's time in the Oval Office. What do lawmakers have to say about it? And what's Biden's vision for his next year in office? With President Biden's first year currently in review, we speak with South Carolina Congressman Ralph Norman to get his thoughts. He also weighs in on the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics and the implications they may have in glorifying the CCP. All the while, the regime continues to carry out multiple genocides. FBI agents raided and searched the home and campaign office of Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar. An FBI spokeswoman confirmed the incident, saying the congressman is part of a law enforcement activity. Biden's approval rating has been sinking throughout the year. He had a 57% approval rating back in February 2021, according to Gallup. Four major polls released this week show about 42% of Americans approve of how Biden is handling his job as president, with around 56% disapproving. According to an AP poll, less than 30% of Americans want Biden to run for another term, including less than half of Democrats. When being asked about this at Wednesday's press conference, here's how Biden responded. I didn't overpromise, and but I have probably uh, outperformed what anybody thought would happen. An NBC poll shows only 5% of Americans said Biden's presidency has been better than expected, the lowest since 1994. Today marks President Biden's first year in the Oval Office. Democrats are praising some of what they view as his achievements, while Republicans say Biden's done a poor job uniting the country. What's Biden's plan for this next year? NTD's Melina Wisecup reports. Democrats are zeroing in on four areas in specific that they see as successes during the Biden administration. That is passing the American Rescue Plan to help our country get through the pandemic and Biden's overall COVID response, providing free masks and tests to American people and the recovery in the jobs market. And today, President Biden is zeroing in yet again on his infrastructure law. Him and the vice president today met with top leaders in their administration to discuss the progress made on this front. Our nation has never fully made this kind of investment. And so the detail matters, execution matters, and I'm looking forward to an update of where we are now and where we're going from here. Speaker Nancy Pelosi today kicking off her press conference with a speech on the jobs recovery over the past year. As we all know, much more needs to be done, but we have made great progress in this year. Just to say one of the most important four-letter words in our economy, is jobs. But Republicans had critical remarks, one of them being that Biden has not lived up to his commitment to bipartisanship. They also zeroed in on inflation. Biden needs to pivot. He's got to get away from um, representing the radical left. He's got to think of how do I help the average American? What's the average American want? They don't want their gas prices up. They want food prices down. So how to deal with this inflation? The Democrat caucus chairman told us earlier this week that in Congress, they're working to address issues of market power, specifically in the food industry. Uh, the food industry and meat processors and the dynamics that exist there, because we do believe there's a lot of pandemic price gouging that is taking place. And President Biden's idea for lowering costs, continuing to work out supply chain constraints and his Build Back Better spending bill. So here's what we're going to do critical job in making sure that the elevated prices don't become entrenched rests with the Federal Reserve. If price increases are what you're worried about, the best answer is my Build Back Better plan. So, Melina, on this Build Back Better bill, it looks like President Biden and the Democrats are not willing to let it go, but it's stalled right now and obviously can't actually be put into law as it is now. What's the next step for Biden on this front? So actually, President Biden and top Democrats seem to be conceding that they'll have to scale back this bill or settle for only passing certain parts of it. And we heard that from President Biden himself during that press conference yesterday. Here's exactly what he said. We can get uh, pieces, big chunks of the uh, Build Back Better law signed into law. 
Speaker Pelosi echoed that same message at her press conference today. And earlier this week, I asked the Democrat caucus chairman if they're considering or working on a more scaled back version of this bill. And he said that while negotiation talks are ongoing, they're really hopeful and they're pushing to get the most important pieces of that bill across the finish line, if not the entire bill itself. So aside from this, what other things does Biden and the Democrats have on their agenda? Well, aside from that, Speaker Pelosi says they're going to be focused on getting a long-term government funding bill passed. We know they've passed a few temporary funding bills, but nothing long-term. And they're being forced to face this now as the deadline comes up in February when that government funding expires. Now, other than that, Pelosi says Democrats are focused on revamping the labor market and helping with that jobs recovery, which we know is one key priority for President Biden, as well as helping to further ease supply chain constraints and further implement his infrastructure law. Steve. Thanks for that, Melina. And President Biden today also clarified his policy on Russia, assuring that America will react with severe economic response if Vladimir Putin sends any troops across Ukraine's border. This comes after his comments yesterday raising concerns. Biden at his press conference also seemed to water down how the U.S. will respond if Russia launched an attack. His comments drew strong criticism, but today the president emphasized that he has been clear with Putin and there's no misunderstandings between the two leaders. Representatives Mike Waltz and Jennifer Wexton introduced a bipartisan bill Wednesday aimed at removing tax-exempt status from the International Olympic Committee. Frankly, the IOC is forcing our athletes to choose between their values. Uh, and choose between uh, being able to compete. So I, for one, don't think they should enjoy that tax exempt status any longer. Uh, it is very clear to me as, as IOC continues in these, in these uh, human rights abuses accomplice, as an accomplice to the, to the human rights abuses of the, of the CCP, that they are not a charitable organization, that they are not deserving of tax exempt status and that the tax, US taxpayer dollars should not be subsidizing their, their actions. The bill is being introduced as the Irresponsible Olympic Collaboration Act, or the IOC Act. In a press release, Waltz said that the IOC is complicit in promoting the communist regime's agenda and that the Olympics will distract the world from Beijing's human rights abuses. He added that corporate partners for the 2022, quote, genocide Olympics should be ashamed to be associated with the IOC and the Chinese Communist Party. American sponsors of the IOC include Airbnb, Coca-Cola, Intel, Panasonic, and Visa. It's reported that the IOC has provided over $800 million to Beijing to help cover the infrastructure cost of hosting the games. The lawmakers say there have been numerous attempts by U.S. officials and international human rights groups to move the 2022 Winter Olympics out of China. They're hoping that their bill will influence the IOC to, quote, change their behavior. The Winter Games will begin in Beijing on February 4th. President Biden just marked his first year since taking office and his report cards are coming in. Here to discuss the president's first year and the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics is South Carolina Congressman Ralph Norman. Congressman Ralph Norman, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report. My pleasure. Congressman, I want to talk to you about China uh, with the upcoming Olympic Games. There's so much wrong with this picture from the obvious disregard from human rights in that country. And now we have warnings to Americans that will be participating in these Olympic Games that they'll be spied on um, by this mandatory app that is supposed to be used to navigate the Olympic Village and that it's compromised. So, Congressman, when is enough enough when it comes to dealing with and legitimizing this Chinese Communist Party? Well, it should be. Enough is enough. Uh, you know, it, it should be by every American. I think the American people realize that, uh, unfortunately, this Biden administration does not. Uh, look at the ties that uh, Anthony Fauci has in, with his mutual funds. Having, uh, you know, I think it's $10.4 million in funds that, um, that uh, communist China uh, has its stranglehold on. Look what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Look at their history. Of a China of a communist country, and here we are uh, having this administration not having the you know not having the foresight to at least put some sanctions on for what they did with the coronavirus. We knew it. We know it came from the lab, 
but it's just an ongoing pattern of, of uh, letting China and all the other rogue countries get, get by with uh, uh, hating America, and we're paying a price for it. Look what we paid with COVID. Uh, we shouldn't even be participating in the Olympics. I know he says that we'll, there'll be no officials that attend there, but we need to do better, more than that. Again, it's actions uh, more than just words, and he, he doesn't have a clue about it. Now, with the Olympics, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, of course. Um, do you think that by allowing Beijing to um, pull this off does further legitimize them when in the face of all of the things that you just mentioned? Not only legitimize it, it condones it. Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of the single uh, man that stood before the tanks back in 1989, uh, where he, uh, you never heard from him again. Anybody that disagrees with this administration in China, you never hear from them. Uh, how does that work for freedom? When you have their newspapers saying that freedom, uh, free speech will not get in the way of the communist regime, basically, uh, that's just intolerable. You don't, you don't condone that. And by participating in the Olympics, uh, as well as look at the basketball teams that go there, all for the, the greed of money. But uh, you just overlook the human rights violations that have continued and will continue under the communist regime. And to infiltrate our, uh, our great country, nah, it's, uh, it's sad to say the least. Now, Congressman, this week marks uh, President Biden's first year in office. He's underwater in a lot of polls out there. He's even taking heat from a lot of Democrats. What's your assessment of his first year? Total disaster. Uh, Steve, this administration uh, has, in a short 11 months, totally de derailed this country. The big question I get when I'm uh, out in the district talking with people is why? Why did he leave Americans behind uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, why did he uh, do away with our natural gas and oil, put a, a, Americans out of work? Why is he condoning violence in the streets and not condoning the anarchists and the criminals that, that do it? Uh, the list goes on and on. And, you know, why is he allowing countries uh, like China to uh, look at uh, Taiwan as, you know, food for their menu? Russia's doing the same with Ukraine. And for him to, to track back yesterday and say, well, maybe it, uh, a type of invasion or a limited invasion is okay. It's, it's been a total train wreck. And, you know, people are tired of, of his rhetoric. They want results that are pro-Constitution. They want to get back to living their lives. Uh, and, and with the inflation rate where it is uh, today, people are paying it. They're feeling it in their pocketbooks, I guess is the best way to say it. But his, his first year has been a total disaster. It's all on his administration, and it's all because of the policies. Um, and it, his, his words don't match the results that he's had. Congressman Norman, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Several colleges in Virginia are ending their vaccine mandates for faculty and staff. That's in order to comply with a new directive from Governor Glenn Youngkin. George Mason University's website states faculty and staff are strongly encouraged to receive vaccine and booster shots when eligible but they're no longer mandatory. Vaccine mandates for students taking in-person classes are still in place. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin announced his plan for combating the COVID pandemic Thursday. He encouraged the nearly 1.6 million unvaccinated Virginians to get a vaccine, but not to implement mandates. The governor's plan includes the COVID-19 vaccine Marshall Plan for Virginia, expanded healthcare flexibility, in support and prioritize testing guidelines. In Maryland, Governor Larry Hogan tweeted on Thursday that his wife has tested positive for the CCP virus. First Lady Yumi Hogan has mild symptoms. Last December, Governor Hogan tested positive. Both have been fully vaccinated and are boosted. FBI agents raided the home and campaign office of Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar on Wednesday. Photos shared by local reporters show agents removing bags, bins, and at least one computer from the congressman's home in Laredo, Texas. Federal agents also went to Cuellar's campaign office. An FBI spokeswoman said agents were, quote, conducting court-authorized law enforcement activity, but did not give further details. Cuellar is a member of the House Appropriations Committee 
and often criticized President Biden's lax immigration policies. Senator Manchin is asking his colleagues, where are the good old days? After he and one other Democrat blocked their own party's efforts to change Senate rules to push through a bill that would change election laws. Biden's voting rule bill may be shot down for now, but questions still remain as to whether there could be another path to change election laws. We take a look where things stand and what might be done. Weekly new jobless claims jumped to a three-month high as Omicron continues to disrupt the labor market. Hello and welcome back to NTD's Capital Report. Democrats are vowing not to give up on national voting law changes. This after their attempts to change the filibuster rules in order to pass it failed. Here's Senator Manchin on the Senate floor defending his decision to block this effort by his own party. Right now we're debating a fundamental change in the Senate rules that will forever alter the way this body functions. For the last year, my Democratic colleagues have taken to the Senate floor cable news airwaves, pages of newspapers across the country, uh, and to argue that repealing the filibuster is actually restoring the Senate to the vision of the founding fathers intended for this deliberate body. My friends, that is simply not true. Okay, I don't know what happened to the good old days, but I can tell you they're not here now. Both Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema voted to turn down Schumer's proposal to change the Senate rules to pass the voter reform bill, although both of those senators support and voted in favor of the Freedom to Vote Act, which failed only because of Republican opposition. Republicans say it would give the federal government too much control over elections. After it failed, Schumer brought up the proposal to change the rules to end debate with a simple majority vote. Republicans cheered as that effort failed as well. And last night, the Senate took a vote and the Democrats' voting bill has been shut down. As to whether or not there could be other ways for the Democrats to push this through, we spoke with President of Liberty Government Affairs, Brian Darling. Here's a look. Brian Darling, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thank you. Now, Brian, on the issue of voter rights, the Democrats don't seem to have enough votes, even with a simple majority, yet they're still seeking ways to circumvent the filibuster. Do they have a path to do so? And if so, how might this play out? Well, they do. There is a pathway to do so, but it would take a lot of work in the part of Democrats that they don't seem to want to do. Right now, there are two proposals that they're pushing. One is to get rid of the filibuster on this bill only and basically declaring a filibuster on this bill unconstitutional and just closing down debate with a simple majority. There's also talk about a tweak to the rules, creating something called a talking filibuster that would force Senate Republican senators to come to the floor and debate uh, under unusual circumstances just for this bill and, and to shut down debate, to force or basically force a vote to shut down debate in the bill. Now, this is a bill Republicans oppose because they see it as a federalization of all elections. They see this as really uh, an infringement in federalism and the idea that the states are the best place and localities are the best place to handle elections. So they're dug in, they're gonna fight, and this is a party versus party battle. But the big problem Democrats are having is getting their own members on board. And as we all know, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia are the ones that are standing in the way of Democrats changing the rules to get rid of the filibuster for this bill. Now, on the issue of the filibuster itself, the Democrats say that it has racist origins. Why do they say that? And have the Democrats also benefited from this uh, filibuster over time? Well, the filibuster does not have racist origins at all. I mean, extended debate has been part of the Senate's history since its inception. What's happened is they've changed the rules on how to shut down debate. In 1917, the uh, Senate changed the rules to force a two-thirds vote, to establish a two-thirds vote to shut down debate. That changed in 1975, and they lowered the threshold to a three-fifths vote, which is 60 votes. And yes, it's true that the filibuster has used 
been used to obstruct civil rights legislation in the past. But Democrats have also used it. They used it to block a pro-life bill in the last Congress. They used it to block a Republican police reform bill. And they used it to block a number of McConnell bills that dealt with the coronavirus relief. And so Democrats used it over 300 times during the last two years of the Trump administration. They're not averse to using it. And we can think back just a few years ago when Senator uh, Chris Murphy of, of uh, Connecticut filibustered for gun control. My former boss, Senator Rand Paul, filibustered back in 2013 on the issue of drones. And so it's been a tool that's been used by both parties for years. And it does, they're wrong when they say it has racist origins. They're just trying to denigrate the filibuster and distract from the fact that they're just trying to seize power in the Senate. Now, I think many Americans, they hear the, uh, the term filibuster, and the next thing you know, they're off you know, to the next ice hockey game or picking up their kids from school. Why should everyday Americans care about this issue? Well, it allows the American people to actually participate in the process. When the Senate slows down a bill through a filibuster, or offer a number of amendments, it allows the American people to understand what far away Washington, D.C. is doing, how this legislation would impact their lives, to call their member of Congress and to say, vote yes, vote no, I like it, I don't like it. This is an important thing. You know, the Senate has always been known as a deliberative body, meaning that they take a lot longer to consider legislation. And the thing about Washington is all these politicians, they want to pass things fast. They don't care about what the American people think. They care more about what other members think, but the American people are really helped by the filibuster because it really slows down Washington and allows them to actually have their say. Brian Darling, thank you. Thank you. The number of new applications for unemployment benefits last week jumped to 286,000, the highest since mid-October. The Labor Department released the figures today. They show that new claims increased by 55,000 from a week earlier. It's now at 286,000. What the market expected was only around 220,000. Meanwhile, the number of continuing claims rose to over 1.6 million. That's an increase of 84,000 from the previous week. Some analysts say that the numbers are pandemic related. However, the Labor Department reported earlier this month that the unemployment rate dropped below 4% in November, the first time since the pandemic began. The Biden administration placed sanctions on four Ukrainian officials. The White House says they cooperated with the Russian government to spread false and destabilizing information in favor of a Russian invasion. The U.S. Treasury Department levied the new sanctions today. Two of the four officials are current members of the Ukrainian parliament. According to a statement by the Treasury Department, Russia's Federal Security Service, or FSB, which is the successor to the KGB, recruited the four individuals. Their destabilizing efforts targeted the political situation in Ukraine and attempted to create a new government controlled by Russia. The CIA has issued an interim finding that most cases of Havana syndrome have not been caused by calculated attacks from Russia or other foreign powers. When you hear them, when you hear what they've been through, there is no doubt in my mind but that they have had real experiences, real symptoms, um, and real suffering. The CIA's interim report delivered to President Biden says that's unlikely, and most of the cases can be explained by other factors like previously undiagnosed illnesses. There are still a few cases that defy explanation. A task force is honing in on about two dozen of them for further review. Republican Senator Marco Rubio released a statement and a video on Thursday. It's important not to misread this report because two things are still true. Number one, there have been people that have been injured and hurt and are suffering and they deserve care and to be treated seriously. And number two, we still have a handful and a significant handful of cases in unique places that there is no explanation for and that in fact are, are outside the norm and those need to continue to be looked at and that needs to be solved. That's all we have for you tonight on the Capitol Report. Thank you for tuning in. From Washington, D.C., I'm Steve Lance and we'll see you tomorrow.